Hi, and thank you everyone and welcome to today's webinar. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the extreme vulnerabilities of many poor and marginalized people, including immigrants and refugees. Today, we have a terrific group of immigrant community leaders and service providers who will share with us their experiences and insights regarding the economic, educational, health, and safety consequences of the pandemic on vulnerable immigrants and newly resettled refugees in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Central Mississippi. Next slide. Our first speaker is Dr. Kimberly Mukherjee, who will discuss the health impacts of the pandemic on immigrants and refugees she serves. Dr. Mukherjee is Assistant Professor of Clinical Pediatrics and the Director of the Immigrant and Refugee Health Section of Community Pediatrics and Immigrant Health at Tulane University School of Medicine here in New Orleans. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you very much, Sue. And, and really, a welcome to everybody and good afternoon to everybody who is joining us today. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to be here today with our panel of experts to take a little deeper dive look into how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our local immigrant and refugee communities here in the Louisiana area. Um, and so first to just very briefly further introduce myself. I am a pediatrician here in New Orleans, and I first came to New Orleans in 2013 uh, for my pediatrics residency training. And it was during that year that I met my first child patient who had come as an unaccompanied child from Central America. Um, and ever since then, I've really dedicated my clinical and teaching career to improving the systems of healthcare for these children in our area. So today it is a real privilege and honor to speak on behalf of the children and families who I take care of to look at the health disparities, the inequities that have been unmasked and magnified and exacerbated during this pandemic, um, and to really take a deeper look as to how that's affecting our families. Many of you have probably heard the saying that we're in the same storm, but we are certainly not all in the same boat, and that couldn't be truer than for our families. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and so I'd like to take a very brief tour um, about around our state to look at some of the demographics. I think it's very important in order to understand the scope of the problem, the magnitude that the impact of this pandemic has had on our immigrant community to first understand who's living here and what our state looks like even in pre-pandemic times. Um, so for those who may not be familiar with our area, we have a very large and growing and fairly new immigrant community in Louisiana. And as you can see from these slides, our Hispanic community has really been the one population that has grown in size as compared to our African American and white populations over the past two decades. In particular, our Hispanic community is concentrated in the greater New Orleans area in Orleans and Jefferson Parish. Next slide, please. It's also really important when we think about the health and well being of our community to think about the environment and the systems, the structural systems that are in place that support individuals and communities. And therefore, it's really important that we acknowledge that Louisiana and Mississippi, along with New Mexico, are the three states in the country with the highest rates of poverty. Next slide. And looking further deeper into that, we can see that Orleans Parish and children in Orleans Parish in particular have rates of poverty almost double or more than double the national average. Next slide. When we have high rates of poverty, we also have high rates of food insecurity. And so when we are speaking about the health of a population, we must keep this in mind. This is a map showing that Louisiana has high rates of child food insecurity in particular. And what I want you to see is that most of our state has prevalence rates of food insecurity much higher than the national average, which is about 17% for children. Next slide. And the last demographic I very briefly wanna to touch on is health insurance. We know that nationally Hispanics are three times as likely to be uninsured as compared to the white population. This map shows you further disparities in health insurance coverage among children who are undocumented around the country. As we can see, Louisiana and Mississippi are two of the states where children who are undocumented do not have access to basic safety net insurance programs such as Medicaid. Next slide. 
So putting this all in perspective, that was a very brief 30,000 foot level tour of the demographics of our state. We have a new fast growing uh, population of immigrant communities, and we have a state that's already very resource limited. So now let's move into March of 2020 and we have a pandemic hit us. And so we were already a very, uh, in a very tricky situation for our populations. As you can see, Louisiana became an early hotspot emerging very quickly early on in, in the pandemic. Um, what I want you to take away from these slides are that the concentration of cases hit the New Orleans area particularly hard. So visualize that on top of the maps I just showed you, where you can see the areas hit hardest by this pandemic in our state are also the areas with our largest Hispanic communities and also some of our areas with our highest rates of food insecurity and poverty. Thank you. Um, and so in the setting of a disaster, all of a the sudden, these social determinants of health that we already know play such a large role in the health and well-being of our communities now become exacerbated. And in terms of looking at how our COVID-19 particular social determinants of health have played a role, I've created this diagram here. Um, but essentially what I want to focus on are two main areas. We have the acute need, the need to address what's happening on the ground right now, how do we get the pulse on what's happening with our community and their acute medical and nutrition needs, but then also our long-term plan. How do we protect our community from further exposure? How do we decrease or mitigate their risk of becoming exposed or becoming you know, sick with this illness? So all of this very suddenly had to come into play at a very fast pace. Um, and so we don't have time to go into all of these different areas, but what I want you to essentially see is that our acute plan really had to be focused on our access to healthcare and our access to nutrition. So suddenly clinics were really, really limited in terms of how we could um, work with our patients. You know, we were limited to just essential and emergent visits only. And my biggest concern as a healthcare provider in this region was that suddenly my population went off of my radar. You know, I was very worried about my kids and their families at home, isolated at home, who suddenly we no longer had these robust social support networks. I didn't have the school nurses, the school social workers, my community partners who often refer these kids to me, suddenly were no longer there to look after these kids. Um, and so we had to address their acute needs somehow. We had to reach out to them. We had to go to their homes to bring nutrition, to bring the food, to bring the supplies to them to keep them safe. Anecdotally, the stories that we were hearing, the number one thing I heard from our families was that they did not have food at home. They could not keep themselves safe. And so all of these factors that you see on this screen became very, very vital in terms of how these families could access resources. Many of these family members told me stories about adults in their household or people who they worked with who were sick enough with symptoms of COVID-19 but would not go to a hospital. They were terrified. They were terrified of their immigration status. They were terrified of not having insurance and how that would impact them financially. Um, government policies played a part. You know, we had families who could no longer or could not access food stamps, for example, or would not because of things like public charge. Next slide. And so just to wrap this all up, I know this is a really big topic in a very short amount of time. But essentially, our roadmap was to address the urgent and acute needs of children and family by bringing food and nutrition to them, but also keeping families safe, partnering with our local health department to bring testing into the neighborhoods. What we saw once we got the word out and, and really helped families understand that this was a safe place to come to get tested, to get resources, we started to see in the last week or two, this is very new information, higher rates in our Latino or in our Hispanic community than in the general population. So this is an emerging trend we will keep an eye on. Next slide. And so to summarize, we have been on the ground as clinicians, but really focus on those resources because that is the number one thing I can do as a pediatrician to keep my population safe is to address their need for nutrition and food. We must bring testing to all of the different communities, to the neighborhoods. We must help empower our communities to understand why this is important and where it is safe to present for care. And we must also be thinking long-term, that long-term roadmap about how to keep our families, our essential workers safe with basic items such as masks and soap and other measures to keep them safe. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for laying out so clearly the health challenges and solutions for co confronting uh, vulnerable immigrants at this difficult time and for the life-saving work that you do. 
Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, we will look at the economic challenges immigrants face as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will begin this part of our discussion by having Ms. Daniel Aleluma, Director of Programs at the Center for Migration Studies, present recent research by CMS on the role of immigrants and jobs now deemed essential. Next slide. Thank you, Sue. Um, so in this next part of the webinar, I will present estimates produced by the Center for Migration Studies on the number of foreign born work, essential workers. So essential workers are those who are keeping our states moving and functional. The services range from the essential healthcare to public infrastructure, manufacturing, wholesale and retail, energy, news, financial institutions, among others. These particular services are based on guidelines provided by the Department of Homeland Security. And the estimates that we will present today are based on 2018 U.S. Census data. Nationally, CMS estimates that of almost 20 million immigrants work in essential critical infrastructure jobs. From this group, approximately 10 million essential workers are naturalized. Almost 5 million are legal citizens and 5.5 million are undocumented, including both DACA and TPS recipients. Let's look more closely at the numbers of immigrant essential workers in Louisiana and Mississippi. First, in Louisiana, we estimate that there are over 79,000 essential workers who are foreign born, representing almost 6% of all essential workers. The largest number among this group is undocumented at 44% of all the foreign born essential workers in the state. In Mississippi, 28,300 essential workers are foreign born. From this group, 40% is undocumented, 30% is naturalized, and the remaining 23% are legal non-citizens. Next slide, please. This table presents the estimates of immigrant essential workers in categories with more than 1,000 foreign born workers in Louisiana. I'm not gonna go into detail within each category, but we wanted to share these tables with you for your reference. To highlight a few categories with significant numbers of immigrant workers, we should look at first, the construction sector, which has almost 28,000 foreign born workers, representing 15% of all essential workers in the sector. This group includes largely undocumented immigrants. We also estimate that 11,400 immigrants work in essential retail jobs, which include restaurants, grocery stores, and gas stations. The third largest concentration of essential immigrant workers is in healthcare, where 8,200 immigrants work at hospitals, medical and dental offices, walk-in care health facilities, and nursing homes. Next slide, please. Now looking closely at Mississippi, this table shows the essential economic activities that employ more than 1,000 immigrants. The top three include, first, essential retail, where 8,600 immigrants work. This group represents 6% of the entire essential workforce in this sector. It is important to highlight that within this group, 43% is undocumented. 4,400 immigrants work in essential healthcare occupations, and, and third, 3,900 immigrants work in construction. And from this group, almost 80% is undocumented. These estimates show the extent to which both legal and undocumented immigrants are crucial to the country's infrastructure and well being. And these are substantial numbers, with, especially when these workers are in high demand in the middle of this pandemic. So, with that, I will pass it on to Sue. Well, thank you, Daniela. Now, as you noted, many undocumented immigrant workers are now performing essential work to keep America's, Americans fed, healthy, and safe. However, at the same time, as we see with this slide, undocumented workers in large numbers have been laid off in industries that have been hard hit by the pandemic, like the hospitality industry and the service sector, where undocumented workers comprised 10% of the labor force in hotels, and 8% of workers in restaurants and food service before the pandemic. Next slide. 
very little relief was provided to undocumented workers in the COVID-19 aid programs passed by Congress in late March. For example, workers without social security numbers are not eligible for the $600 a week pandemic unemployment insurance or the cash payments of $1,200 per adult, $500 per child, even if the undocumented worker had been paying income tax for years with an ITIN number provided by the IRS. Next slide. Our next speaker, Ms. Marilo Martinez Rivera, will help us understand the immense economic difficulties undocumented immigrant families are experiencing as a consequence of the pandemic. Marilo co-founded and leads an organization, Mujeres Luchadoras, that works to support immigrant women and families who have lost their husbands and fathers to deportation. We are so grateful that you can be with us today, Marilo. Thank you, Dr. Sue, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for inviting me here today. Um, a little over three years ago, we started seeing a notable increase in detentions and deportations of undocumented people in our community, many with deep roots in this country. Some have lived here for over two decades. With increased detentions and deportations, we obviously have an increase in single parent families, mostly women who are left to raise their children on their own. Every single family affected by these new policies struggle to survive. Moms struggle to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. We know also that aside from the physical needs families have, they also deal with anxiety, worry, stress, and depression. So after conversations with many of these women who we met at detention centers, a few of us decided that we were stronger together. We started supporting each other emotionally and in other ways. And we soon realized that through organizing, we could not only support each other, but we also could help many other families who faced similar challenges. And so Mujeres Luchadoras, which translates in English to Women Warriors, was born. We are a small nonprofit serving the greater New Orleans area. Over 99% of our donations go to directly impacted families. All the work we do is on a volunteer basis. When we started out as a collective, we initially obtained funding through our own fundraising efforts. We did food sales, raffles, and other activities to raise funds, which in turn we made available to our families to help them meet basic needs and to thrive. We have tried to anticipate the needs of our families because we know that in our community, there is no emergency fund or safety net to tap into. And because of this, through the years, we've organized school supply drives, diaper drives. We've had drives where we collect sundries, just basic items that somebody might not seem like a lot, but for our, our families who struggle and live day to day means a lot. As you all may imagine, many of our women have to work two to three jobs to be able to afford a place to live and to buy food for their kids. Now with this pandemic, all these jobs are closed. Our women work in hospitals, in restaurants, in hotels, some in schools, others babysit for families in their neighborhood. All of this has been paused, and we don't know when these jobs will become available again. For example, yesterday I was talking to a mom about a restaurant she works at that is reopening this weekend at 25% capacity. She was told that not everyone will be asked back to work, and she understands that she is at the bottom of the list of workers to be recalled. So now this family will continue to face an uncertain future like so many, many others. We have been fortunate that through our community partners and other small donors, we have been able to help a number of our families with rental assistance for the past few months. We have also uh, do research on a regular basis, uh, looking for information on food distribution sites, and we share this information with our families so as to uh, avoid that gap in food insecurity. We try very hard to lift each other up during these difficult times. Typically, we would organize activities for families to get out with their kids and do something fun. But like everyone else, all of our activities are now on hold. Our lives seem to be on hold as we all struggle to keep afloat. Uh, without the support of people in our community during these difficult times, we would never be able to do what we do. So we're eternally grateful for that. 
We have always said that our mission is to be a support for each other, give each other a hand up and not a hand out. For example, when one of our families faced an unexpected emergency uh, and needed urgent dental work, didn't have the funds, what we did was we got together and organized a fundraising activity so that she could meet this need. With everything on lockdown now, it seems that at the moment our hands are tied and there's little in terms of fundraising that we can do. In spite of all this, however, our voices are so strong and we continue to uplift and encourage each other, even if it's from afar. Um, thank you all for your time, Dr. Sue. Oh, thank you so much, Mari Lowe, for providing such important insights into the economic challenges undocumented immigrants are facing in our community now. And even more so, thank you for the vital work that you and Mahari Zuchagotis do building networks of love and support in our community. Uh, next slide. Our next speaker is Ms. Julie Norman, who will now discuss some of the safety issues that have arisen in the immigrant community as a consequence of the pandemic. Julie is a bilingual counselor for trauma recovery services at the New Orleans Family Justice Center. Thank you for being with us today, Julie. Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm honored to be here with all of those incredible panelists and with our audience. Um, so the New Orleans Family Justice Center is an agency that provides wraparound services to survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, child sexual abuse. Um, about 25% of our clients are immigrants, many of whom are undocumented. Um, I personally have worked for about more than 10 years with immigrants and refugees in the U.S. and internationally, and much of my work has focused on mental health and gender-based violence. Um, today, as Dr. Sue mentioned, I'll be focusing on the impact of the COVID crisis on immigrant survivors of inter intimate partner violence. But before I get into that, I just wanted to share some words written by one survivor. Um, back when we could gather in real life we had an expressive writing group for support and healing through writing and during the pandemic we've been con continuing this by sharing writing prompts related to quarantine and this experience um, through phone email text message so here's a few lines from one woman um, who hopes it can pr provide some insight on her and many immigrants experience um, hopefully people from this country can appreciate how we immigrants in this country feel when we come here for a dream and leave our families and friends behind far away after cr crossing thousands of kilometers. We have lived and felt the loss of family and friends without being able to see them or be with them or say a final goodbye. Sincerely, it is exactly what many people have experienced who have lost their relatives and have not been permitted to say goodbye due to COVID-19. Um, so just wanted to share that compassionate insight. Um, and moving on from that, next slide. You may have heard or seen news about the increase in domestic violence, um, both in the US and internationally during this crisis. I'm gonna talk about what the factors of COVID and shelter in place are that increase the dangers of home, while at the same time decrease the routes to safety and how politics, racism, and structural realities exacerbate the vulnerabilities that immigrants face. Um, so increased dangers at home. Stress and crisis don't cause abuse and violence, but they definitely can escalate it when it exists. Research shows that historically in disasters, war, displacement, financial disasters, natural disasters, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence increase. Um, Perpetual proximity is a factor here, as most or all of us are experiencing. Shelter at home means perpetual proximity with those you live with. And when there's abuse and violence in your home, this means there's no escape from those constant threats. This also means that an abuser has constant access to monitor his partner's or her partner's activities. This could be controlling how they dress, their movements, who they communicate with, what they eat, et cetera. Um, isolation is a common tactic um, of abuse and control, and right now isolation is also a public health necessity. So when abuse involves isolating victims from communities and support networks, then the isolation and shelter at home just exacerbates that, especially for undocumented folks who are often already isolated or forced to hide themselves in various ways. 
Financial control is often the core component of domestic violence. Um, and I love how these different parts of different speakers interconnect. So referring back to um, Murillo and the ways that you know, folks have lost their jobs, especially people working in hotel service, childcare, um, have lost incomes, they're excluded from stimulus checks, unemployment, and other assistance funds. Um, there are, uh, you know, definitely some gender disparities. And although domestic violence can happen to people of all genders, um, the majority of victims are women. And so given that um, many kind of female heavy jobs are not um, continuing right now, this means that many women are left without, many immigrant women are left without income. So this creates a situation where um, abusive partners can leverage money and debts to control, punish, or threaten their partners, um, threatening to kick them out of their home, denying them food or other resources, or forcing them to perform physical or sexual labor. Additionally, this loss of income can lead to increased dependency upon abusive partners. Some women I work with had previously planned to move out of abusive homes, but now having lost their income and with no clear timeline of when they may be able to return to work or earn consistently again, it's just not possible for them to pay rent and support kids alone. For one woman who had escaped just prior to the pandemic, this meant being forced to return to an ex-abusive partner. Unfortunately, when the structures of our society exclude immigrants from support or punish them for seeking help with public charge rules, people are forced into lives they otherwise wouldn't choose if they had access to safe options. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so talking about the decreased routes to safety. If we look at what's needed for an individual or a family to choose to escape a violent home or situation or relationship, these are some of the main components. So safety planning, usually with the help of advocates, friends or family, talking through risks and making plans. Um, support networks to provide childcare, transportation, help with moving, resources, et cetera, when somebody does leave an abusive home. Support from institutions and courts to ensure safety. That might be getting a protective order, um, sometimes police involvement, custody proceedings or criminal court proceedings, emergency shelter, and then of course money, relocation and stabilization resources. Um, and then psychosocial mental health support for adults and their children. Um, so you probably don't need me to say too much about how the pandemic has fractured all of these central components of safety seeking and especially how this impacts immigrants. Um, isolation and shelter in, in place cuts people off from support networks and advocates. It might be dangerous for a person to to make a phone call or send a message or look up a website for help if they're under constant surveillance of an abusive person. Additionally, language barriers, lack of services in native languages and limited internet and technology capacities are another barrier here. Um, as Dr. Kim mentioned, um, for folks who are undo undocumented or uninsured, risks and fears of virus exposure, exposure may prevent um, survivors from seeking help or family from supporting because if they're afraid of getting sick because they can't get health care, this just increases the risk they're taking. Um, service, ne service networks have been fractured. In many ways, the world has shut its doors, community centers are closed, support groups suspended, core operations reduced, and shelter capacities have been decreased due to distancing requirements and the increased need for shelters means that many shelters have been at capacity. Um, and again, money. <laughs> if somebody doesn't have money to get out of a situation and then support themselves for the near future, they can't make the decision to do that. Next slide, please. Um, here I just want to talk about a few additional dynamics that I've seen in my work. Um, and you know, I'm sure many of you all have seen, but um, and are aware of. So clearly, politics of fear, exclusion, exclusion, and racism. Um, immigrants facing constant threats of ICE and authorities, language barriers, fears of reaching out for help, um, and concern it could impact their future immigration status. 
Then also talking about families' histories. Um, some folks I work with have debts from their journeys to the US. They might owe money to their partner, they might owe money to a family member, or a community member, potentially the person they're renting from. And this can just create an additional um, dynamic that could be abusive or pressuring or harassment if a person in addition to losing their job, not being able to meet their basic needs is also unable to, to continue paying off these debts. Um, so this can um, add to unsafe environments that people are facing. And then safety spanning borders. I'm sure all of us have felt our own anxieties and fears about our loved ones. And just taking a moment to imagine what this feels like for folks who have to hold the realities of multiple countries and their worries. Fears about their safety here, as well as their safety and health and survival of loved ones in other countries where they're facing very different adversities in this pandemic. Um, and then just pointing out for, you know, many moms or survivors of domestic violence who not only um, bear the responsibility of supporting their children here, but also potentially kids or family members in other countries. So the loss of income um, during this pandemic means that family who rely on these remittances in other countries can't meet, their, meet basic needs. Um, in terms of looking ahead, <laughs> I like to focus on the idea of long-term stabilization. And, um, you know, in just a month, two months of this crisis, we've already seen how, how few resources there are for immigrants and undocumented folks. And just trying to figure out what it looks like moving forward to be able to support and help families stabilize for three, six, 12 months. Um, because otherwise I have, big concerns about the future safety and stability of immigrants and especially those experiencing violence in their homes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julie, for providing us with valuable information to better understand uh, the complex safety challenges facing mainly immigrant women now during this pandemic. And thank you for all you do for immigrant justice. Next, we are going to be looking at the educational and other challenges vulnerable immigrants are confronting during the COVID-19 pandemic in the town of Forest in central Mississippi, a community recently devastated by ice raids and now a pandemic hotspot. On August 7, 2019, 681 Latino immigrant workers including about 125 members of immigrant families in Forest, were arrested at seven chicken processing plants in central Mississippi. Next slide. After a terrifying day, about half the workers arrested, mainly women with small children at home, were released with electronic monitoring devices on their ankles. Next slide. Most of the other workers were transported to immigration detention centers in isolated locations in central Louisiana. Next slide. Now, Ms. Monica Soto will discuss how the pandemic is impacting immigrants in forest and how immigrant families are confronting the challenge of educating their children at home after forest schools were closed March 16th in response to the pandemic. Monica is a tutor with the Forest Municipal School District and an outreach worker for El Pueblo, which provides legal services, ESL classes, and community building programs for immigrants in central Mississippi and the Mississippi Gulf Coast. For this portion of the webinar, Monica and I decided to use an interview format for a little change of pace. So thank you for being with us today, Monica. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, okay, here's my first question. Uh, the, the U.S. Census in 2019 uh, tells us that 5,600 people live in forest, but that about 20% of the population of forest is foreign born. And that's in stark contrast to the rest of the state of Mississippi, where only 2.4% of your community is foreign born. So Monica, where are most immigrants from in forest and why did they decide to come to forest? Well, we have several immigrants from different areas in Central America, but right now our biggest population is uh, from Guatemala. Most of them um, have come here to work. We have several poultry plants around the area. This is a small town, but they one comes, they find work, and then they bring family members and it's become their home. Um, 
they secure rental places and they bring their family members, but I think they come here because they did feel safe. This was their home up until the raids. They were able to work and, and be comfortable. Thank you. Now the meat and poultry industry have been hot spots for outbreaks of the COVID-19 virus. So how has COVID-19 virus struck the immigrant community? Has it struck the immigrant community in Forest? It has tremendously, and I don't think the numbers are showing really how many cases we have. Um, they don't have health insurance, so they're not going to the doctor. They're staying home, and ambulance are having to come into the house, and then they see that a whole family is sick. We have one family member that works in the plant is bringing the COVID into the home. They don't have a lot of education as to how to quarantine with, they think just staying in the home is quarantine. So it's being spread among the families. They also share rent. So there's more than one family living in that home and it spreads to more than one family. So it's hitting a lot of people. Um, it's really hard because they don't have the access to groceries. So once you are in the home, they can't get the food. So now we're struggling with trying to find the families that are sick and then trying to figure out how to get the food to them. And it, it is coming that they're getting it in the plan. We've had a lot of cases. We actually had um, two people pass away from one of the forest plants last week from COVID. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, uh, so many challenges in, in that community in such a short amount of time. Uh, let's talk now about the educational challenges that, that you're facing there in Forest. Next slide. Uh, a recent survey of Louisiana school districts a response to the pandemic found that one out of four students do not have access to a computer, that one out of four students are receiving no free feedback on their learning, and in addition, the majority of the content being provided students is review work. Now, Mississippi has not yet compiled data from a similar survey administered in late April, but we'll probably see very similar findings due to the high poverty in both states. So Monica, what are some of the challenges that immigrant families and forests are facing now in regards to their children's education? The children are at a great disadvantage. There's going to be a big learning gap through this. Um, I mean, 80 to 85 percent of our parents are illiterate or only receive um, very minimal education in their countries, so they can't help with the homework. We also have language difficulties. We have um, about maybe 11 to 12 dialects, indigenous dialects they speak, so Spanish is not their first language either. They um, don't have access to internet. When the raid hit, you had to choose what was more important and ha having internet at home was not a priority. So they don't have access. The school does not um, provide them with Chromebooks or tablets to work from home. They are getting packages then home in the mail, but it is review work, like you said, and it is, there's no feedback for them. Um, unfortunately, this is gonna impact us in the future. And uh, you had mentioned earlier when we talked about the, the meals that kids were getting at school. Yes, um, that was a big thing for us. You know, when the raid hit, at least they had two secure meals at school, which were fits and lunch, and the parents didn't have to worry about providing three meals a day. Once um, school shut down, the parents now become responsible for feeding them three meals a day. And when you're already scarce for resources and groceries, it just became more stress on the parents. We did try for a while to do pickup lunches, but um, our area has been a hot spot, and we are now. Um, Scott County is one of the most the counties that has the most numbers right now, so we had to stop feeding them. Wow. So, uh, how does the educational experience, the current educational experience of immigrant children attending public schools in Forest, how would you compare that to children in Forest who are able to attend private schools? Um, they do not have the same opportunities. Children that go to private school are, they're still getting a full day's lesson. They're online, you're getting classes, you're gonna be able to watch a teacher, you get the, you know, the feedback from the teacher and they're learning new things, they're not just reviewing. So there's gonna be a, a, a gap, they're never gonna catch up. The, the kids from private school are able to go on and keep learning and then our kids are not. They um, 
they need the technology and the resource and there's no there's nothing for them there that will get them ahead well now we know from research uh, next slide including a recent study by the jesuit social research institute that the deep and pervasive poverty in Mississippi hinders educational attainment of Mississippi children of color, including immigrant children, Latino children in Mississippi, where 38% live under the poverty line. So Monica, what do you think needs to happen right now so that immigrant children can begin to at least start to catch up with their peers if schools have to close again in the fall? Um, I really think that if we could give them the hotspot access, if they were able to, um, the school was able to provide a laptop or a tablet or Chromebook to take home also with the hotspot, that would give them the ability to be able to get online. And there are websites that are provided for them with logins from school. As long as they can get on there, that would give them feedback. They were able to ask questions and learn. You know, the parents can't help them at home, but that would give them an outsource to get their questions answered so i think also education for the parents letting them know like there is on um, facebook virtual classroom some teachers are using but the parents don't know how to access that they don't have the data on their phones to you know let the children sit three times a week to watch a classroom on virtual facebook um i really think maybe if there was a tv channel that would teach core curriculum per grade something they can see visual you know, interaction in English that could teach them and get them ahead. Maybe that can help close the gap. Wow, well, well thank you, Monica, for all that you do. I know you, 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 you love your community, you've lived there 20 years, and I wanna thank you and El Pueblo for everything y'all have been doing to support immigrants in Central America, in Central Mississippi, you know, after the raids and now in this, this pandemic. Thank you. And, and, and next, next slide, uh, we are very pleased to have as our next speaker, Mr. Dauda Sasse, uh, the Executive Director of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Refugee Congress for the Southern United States. Dauda will discuss the special challenges now facing newly arrived refugees and green card holders in Louisiana. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dauda. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Wesha. Um, I am delighted to be here today. And, and I want to do a special thanks to all the wonderful and passionate speakers um, for your churching messages um, to our audience. And I want, also want to thank the Center for Migration Study for providing this platform where we can discuss the issues that are affecting the refugees and immigrant community in Louisiana and Mississippi. My name is Dauda Sisse. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants. And as Dr. Wesha said, I am a board member of Refugee Congress representing the Southern region. I also serve as the Mayor International Relations Commission, Mayor Sharon Westin Broom of Baton Rouge. I came to the United States as a refugee from Sierra Leone due to the terrible war took away my dad and my younger sister, seven years old, was born alive. My family house was set on fire with my mom, siblings, and other relatives inside. I spent nine years in a refugee camp where I met my beautiful wife, Alima. And now we have five lovely children. I am currently working as a process technician at Dow Chemical. Next slide, please. Thank you. Due to the many challenges newly arrived and resettled refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers face in adjusting to, new, in, in adjusting to their new homes, learning a new language and a way of life. In 2016, with the leadership training received from Refugee Congress, and also with the support of refugees and immigrant leaders from 17 countries, short as Nigeria, Cameroon, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, etc., etc., founded LORI to address the service gaps of the refugees and immigrants living in our beautiful state of Louisiana. Our primary mission 
is to assist refugees and immigrants throughout their various stages of integration in Louisiana, enabling them to become self-reliant. Next slide, please. The one community dialogue. The coronavirus, this pandemic has significantly impacted the refugee community living in Louisiana. Many refugees, as our previous speakers have said, they are essential worker. They are front line of this pandemic, short as healthcare failed, the truck drivers that are critical to the supply chain, the grocery store, the meat plants. So in order for us, to navigate through this challenge, we form, we launch the One Community Dialogue to serve as a safe platform to educate, engage, and connect with our community. Through this One Community Dialogue, we have learned a lot about the issues facing refugees, vulnerable immigrants, and asylum seekers. And I know there are a lot of issues which other panelists have spoke about, but I just want to touch on these three, the fear of public charge, language access, and unemployment benefits. Next slide, please. Thank you. Public charge. The Trump administration recently instituted a new rule that would deny admission or make someone ineligible to get green card if the government thinks that individuals might receive public benefits. And quite recently, food stamp Medicaid has been included in this public charge. And the vulnerable refugees and immigrants that are seriously affected at this, which are the seniors, the non-English speaker, low-income family. But let me be clear, immigrants living in the United States are eligible for unemployment benefits. They are eligible for emergency Medicaid. And especially with the COVID-19, majority of them are el el eligible for free drive-through testing. But as the COVID-19 has significantly impacted us, community across the United States, especially the refugees and immigrants living in Louisiana, many of them are afraid to file for employment or apply for those benefits. And much of this fear, much of this fear stems from the Trump administration public charge rules. The public charge rule makes it harder, very harder, for people of limited means to qualify for visa, green card, or family reunification. And that is the case for the refugees. Family reunification, people have to choose either to apply, to apply for those basic needs or stand the risk of getting their family reunited with their family. Next slide, please. Uh, I can't hear you, Donna. <laughs> okay, for some reason, the mute. Language access also, <laughs> sorry about that. Language access also is lack of es um, essential information in their local languages. And at this crisis right now, getting the right message, at the, um, it is very critical and it will save lives. And I just want everyone to remember, there are community members who don't read or write even in their local languages. So creating a multilingual materials in both written and audio will save lives and reach out to the border populace. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the final thing I wanna talk about is the unemployment benefits, especially in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Majority of the refugees and immigrants who have been laid off or followed Remember, these people work in the hospitality industry, in the restaurant, as our speakers have mentioned earlier, and the hotel, gas station, and those people have been laid off. And they have severely struggled to navigate the system to apply for unemployment benefits. Now, some of the reasons that they are struggling, which is one is lack of familiarity with the process of applying. And there comes again with the language barrier, 
These people cannot read and write. No internet service. They fear that also. And this is key, the fear. And all of this, the fear kept coming up. The fear of their reduced income might count against them in the future public charge. And another group that is left out of this also again is the US citizens and some permanent residents who are member of mixed family status. We are excluded from the stimulus check that Congress passed. At Lori, we noticed that applying for an employment benefit can be difficult, even for fluent English speakers to understand where to apply and how to apply and deal with the question that arise. So we begin to provide urgently needed education for refugees and immigrants. So let me wrap up. We begin to apply. One is to diffuse the fear, educate them to diffuse the fear. And second, we educate them how to apply for unemployment and other benefits through the one community dialogue outreach that we launch. And once again, I want to thank you all for this time. And I will be open for question and answer. Back to you, Dr. Wesher. Thank you, Dada. Thank you so much for all the great work that you and Lori do, uh, building networks of friendship and support here in uh, Louisiana and educating our, our new arrival refugees and immigrants. Uh, before we go on to questions and answers, we have one last slide. And uh, we'd like to uh, uh, conclude uh, this portion of the, of the uh, webinar with a call to action. First of all, um, we need our listeners to continue to work for humane and just immigration policies. And we're hoping that the information we gave today will inform and inspire you to do this. But secondly, we also need you to please consider providing critical emergency assistance to vulnerable immigrants who are struggling to survive in this pandemic. And as we've heard time and again, there is not a safety net for our for those immigrant brothers and sisters of, of us so on this slide we have got some um, uh, uh, links to donation sites that our presenters have pre presented to us today given to us today we'll send it to you in the email next week with the slides so if you're able to please donate to one of these organizations or to an organization serving vulnerable immigrants in your own community and I know that um, we're very grateful to the work that, for example, uh, Granny's NOLA has done here in New Orleans uh, with their work with, uh, with Mari Lowe and Mujeres uh, Utadores. So now, um, thank you all very much. We're doing very, very well on time, and we're going to take some questions now from our audience. And um, uh, we have a question here from Maria Clark, uh, a wonderful journalist who's work both here in New Orleans, and I believe now you're in Lafayette. And the question is, has any data been made available showing cases specifically among Hispanic residents in Jefferson and Orleans Parish? I guess the best person to answer that might be Dr. Uh, Mukherjee. Sure, happy to address that. Um, you know, I think um, the short answer to that is that we just don't have our pulse on the situation fully. Um, as many of the speakers have alluded to, we all suspect and fear very much so that there are many more cases out there than we know about. Um, I will say, though data has not necessarily been published yet, um, there are ongoing efforts in Orleans Parish in particular to really try to get a better sense of this. Um, in particular, the Orleans, uh, the New Orleans Health Department is really been um, you know, looking at how do we bring testing into neighborhoods and into areas where those without a car could not access the drive-through test sites um, or those you know, who may have been uh, unable to provide a Louisiana ID that may have been asked for at the drive-through test sites. You know, we're trying to eliminate those types of barriers to make testing more equitable and accessible. Therefore, in some of those more recent numbers, we are seeing much higher rates among those who are identifying as Hispanic. And it is important to remember when we have this, these data, you know, it is really dependent on uh, people reporting information like that. Not everybody feels comfortable reporting their ethnicity. And so we do have um, quite a bit of data in our state health department that has uh, un unidentifiable, you know, ethnicity. So the state health department has been reporting on deaths and, and who we know um, 
husband dying from COVID. And if you look at that, the Hispanic, those who are identifying his, as Hispanic who are dying from COVID is a much smaller percentage compared to African-American and other populations. However, you know, I think what your question is getting at is just number of cases where if we look at that information, we are actually seeing much higher numbers. Very rough, you know, estimates over the last couple of weeks, we're seeing rates of 15 to 25% positivity in those who we are testing at some of our smaller, you know, clinics and with the health department. But what we really need is to look at a trend over time and see how that data progresses. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Um, uh, Monica, would you, do you know if you've heard of any data uh, in, about Mississippi, but especially with all the, um, you know, poultry plants there, have you heard of any data about um, the rate of infection amongst um, immigrant workers? Uh, I have, there, there has not been, like, I mean, that I've heard of data, but I know just working in the community that it is all over you know, every race that works in the plant, every ethnicity, but it's, um, there's more Hispanic workers in the plants right now. They're the ones that are essential. They can't draw unemployment, so they've chose, and then they have to stay working. So our cases have really, for the last three weeks, I've seen them in the community sick, just seeing them out. They're not getting tested, so it's hard to get them on a graph. Now, now, Monica, if I understand, the workers, the immigrant workers in the poultry plants now have letters, uh, letters uh, from their employers. And, and what the, could you tell us a little bit about what those letters say? Yes, they're, um, they're essential workers and they have, you know, they can go when, uh, when our care, oh, sorry, when our curfew comes between 10 and 6 in the morning, they're able to go back and forth to the plant and work. So now they get that essential worker letter. Um, they won't get pulled over or they won't get the fine for being out and during that time, but they have been ticketed for the no license and no insurance during that time. Okay, but in other words, workers who in August were arrested and thrown into detention. Are now essential, and they have a letter saying they're essential. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, some that were able to return to the plant and are waiting on, on you know, word from immigration. Now they're essential, now they're needed, and they, like I said, once they have become sick, are not, they can't, don't have access to unemployment during their illness that they caught in the poultry plants. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Maria Fazio, and the question is, what is the attitude um, of the non-Latino, non-immigrant community towards the essential immigrant workers? And is there support from community, from the community to the immigrant plight? Mari Lo, could you answer that question for us? Uh, unmute yourself. Oh, or Dowda, yeah. No, I was just telling my little unmute. Yes, again, the question is, what is the attitude of the uh, not non-immigrant community towards essential immigrant workers? Um, I think that, especially here in the in this part of the country, we've always dealt with a lot of um, veiled racism. I think that now, however, a lot of people are realizing that um, our undocumented families are important in, especially in the front line. Um, they're, I don't know, we have a lot of support in our community, but at the, at the same time, there's a lot of, um, you know, people who don't appreciate it, the work that we do. I guess now it's more noticeable now that uh, we don't have, the restaurants are not open and the hotels are not open, you know, about the importance of the work that our families do. And I might add that uh, this August is the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and Tulane and Berkeley did a study that found that half of the workers in the reconstruction effort were immigrants, and half of those workers were undocumented. In other words, 25% of the folks that put New Orleans back together after the storm were undocumented workers. And uh, uh, we're gonna definitely commemorate that on the 15th anniversary, and I know we will definitely have people here at Loyola that are going to be speaking out about the gratitude they have for how immigrants help them rebuild their, their homes. Um, I, I ha we have a question here um, from Hiroka Kasuda, um, our uh, wonderful uh, immigration attorney at the Loyola uh, Immigration Law Clinic. And uh, Hiroka's question is, this is for Dowda and Mary Lowe, uh, since the onset of COVID-19, how are you conducting outreach to your respective communities and what kind of services have you specifically been able to provide? Uh, why don't you go first, Dowda? 
Um, thank you so much, I'm Iweko, for the questions. And it is tough because we are all confined at home and to stay at home. But we're able to reach out to the community through the one community dialogue that we launch with two Zoom call. And also we have the, the WhatsApp one community team messages that we use also to communicate our team. And also we do interpretation. Currently we're working with the city to interpret um, vital information to the community. We do it both in written and with audio, and especially the audio through the WhatsApp uh, messages. And then the other question is, the services that will be offered, one is the translation, and two, we have seen increase, getting increased call of this fear also, people to apply uh, for their benefit. And one of the service also is create a platform to cancel members not to be afraid. These are services, especially with the stimulus check. We got family that receive their check and they are afraid to cash it, thinking that this uh, money will in turn affect them because this is a family that's already petitioned to reunite with their family. So people have to choose between a life situation that's to receive or reunite with their family. So um, that also has been going on. And also we, there we saw food such and such as people mentioned, especially the children, and they're now at home. We provide also food. We drop off food to the immigrant and refugee community in the city of Baton Rouge, which we dropped. And we launched also, we discovered that there's a lot of, um, how they call it, anxiety with the youth especially the high schoolers that miss their prompt date and all that. So we launched the youth development program where we encourage the youth and create a platform for the youth to come together and collaborate so that they don't miss some of the routine that they miss in school. They connect with others. So there's a lot going on, but I, those are the only few that I'm going to highlight now. That's, for now. that's terrific. Mari Lowe? Well, since the, as soon as the pandemic started, one of the first things I did was I went to Second Harvest Food Bank because um, I've never had to use a pension and I don't know how it worked. And I called their offices and I said, so how can our families get food if they're facing food insecurity? Because obviously a lot of times the, um, the children get food stamp, but that's not enough. So they run out before the end of the month. And so they explained to me, you know, the steps to go about. It used to be that it was in your neighborhood. Like if you lived in Kenner, there's a food pantry there in Kenner that you can go to. If you're on the West Bank, for families in the West Bank, there was a different food distribution center. So I got all that information and I shared it with my, um, with, our, with our families. And, you know, and I kept reading and every day I'm looking online, you know, where is there a food distribution center? We share that information. And then we have some families that lack transportation and so I've had to, on two occasions go get in that line, which as many of you see on the news, they're miles and miles long. And I was just sharing with somebody that I got in one of the lines to get food for, um, we have like two or three families that have, don't have transportation. So I said, you know, I'm gonna go get some food and then we put some other stuff together and make these food baskets for them. And when we got, I was in the line for like three hours, somebody came and said, you know, we ran out of food. We only have, um, we're giving out four heads of lettuce and three onions. And I'm like, you know, so I, I left because I was already there three hours. That was nearly, you know, what we need. So, um, and then I went another time and we got, during these last five, six hours, and we get about the food that's probably for a And how about rent assistance? So, yeah, so we've been sharing, we have a WhatsApp group and all our families, it's like, it's like the small village. And I tell them all the time that we're all a village. We're all helping each other. So it's word of mouth, it's texting, it's in our WhatsApp group sharing information, sharing information about testing, because we've had families come and say, oh, I don't feel good, I think I have COVID, and I'm like, there's a testing site here. They just started, like Dr. Kimberly said, bringing in the, the testing um, sites to our neighborhoods, because I know they've had in Kenner and in Metairie, so we've been encouraging our families. We do a little bit of everything, because in our school, our school parish gave out work that they have to turn in, and so I immediately send out the information and say anybody needs help with translation, because language barrier obviously is a real thing one of the greatest needs rent we got donations from nola grannies and from other small donors and we've been able to provide rental assistance for the past two months i've also called up the landlords we made a list and i explained to them who we are and would you be willing to give us a discount 
believe it or not, less than half of them have been willing to budge. Somebody just told me at the beginning of May, um, I'm like, you know, this is a single mom with four kids. She lost her job. He's like, the pandemic doesn't have anything to do with the rent. So we don't always get positive answers, but we keep on trying. And this is how we, we operate basically throughout of mouth, like in a village, you know, everybody knows it. it's through word of mouth. Now that face-to-face -face, literally, but via um, text messages and WhatsApp. Well, well, thank you. It's just so clear what community-based organizations like Mujeres Ruchadoras and Lori and El Pueblo are able to do um, in these crises, as well as our well-established com um, community-wide organizations like Catholic Charities. We have a question here from um, Yuling Yu, and her question, I think this is for Dr. Mukherjee, could you talk about the healthcare and medical resources available to undocumented immigrants? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that we in the healthcare field really want to get the information out to our families about is, is that we are still here and we still want to see you. Um, in particular, we want to make sure your chronic conditions are being addressed. You know, we know that when COVID hit hospitals nationwide, emergency rooms and hospital wards and certainly clinics saw a huge drop in the number of people presenting for care for the basic routine things that we would normally see people for. And that scared, you know, many of us thinking about, well, are those heart attacks happening at home? Is that, are, you know, the diabetes uncontrolled at home, et cetera. And, and certainly for kids, we know that they can get sick very quickly when things start to go wrong. Um, so first and foremost, we are still here. Community health centers are absolutely a resource for our undocumented community. So I practice um, a couple of days a week at Crescent Care, for example, which is a community health center. Um, and we do not require health insurance to be seen at a community health center. These are our safety net clinics um, that are available to our uninsured population. Um, and so there are, there's a wide range of community health centers throughout the New Orleans metropolitan area, certainly across the state, and, and I imagine so in Mississippi as well. Um, and we have um, certain resources um, that before Health Net, for example, where somebody can go online and look at, find the, the clinic closest to their home based on their zip code. Um, and so the community health centers are certainly operating at a, just like any other clinic, at a much um, smaller fraction of what our normal operations are. A lot of that has to do with the state guidelines and what we're able to see and what we're not able to see. I will say from a pediatric perspective that all well child visits are deemed essential visits. Um, so please help us get the word out that children, we need children coming in for their well visits. We need them coming in for vaccines. We don't want to see an outbreak of measles or pertussis or other vaccine preventable conditions months from now as a result of people not coming in for health care. Along those lines in our hospitals, um, you know, we want everyone to be assured that clinics and hospitals are taking many safety precautions to keep you safe when you're there to really decrease your exposure risk. So if you need to go to the hospital or clinic for something other than COVID, please go and know that there are a lot of safety precautions in place. Certainly part of our education and outreach has been also um, uh, really helping our, our community understand what symptoms of COVID are so that we're not waiting too long in our homes, you know, before symptoms get too severe and presenting for care. Um, and so I would definitely start with your community health centers and your hospitals and, and to feel safe going to those locations. Can, can people without health insurance, including undocumented immigrants, get free COVID testing at the community health centers? Yes. And that's going to vary from site to site, but there certainly are locations where it is free. Um, and also the, all of the neighborhood testing that is being performed, for example, by the city health department, that is free testing. You do not need health insurance. Um, and so you will, if you do have health insurance, they will ask for it, but it is not required and you will not receive a bill if you do have health insurance. Excellent. Great information. I think this question, next question could best be answered by Julie, because I know you're very involved in um, uh, immigrant detention issues in Louisiana through the Louisiana's, um, Louisianans for Detained Immigrants. And this question is from Juan Aguilian, and it's how active have ICE and ERO detention and de deportation operations been, uh, and 287G been during uh, the pandemic in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, ICE has continued to detain people and jails that have um, 
that collaborate with ICE have continued to um, turn people over to detention facilities upon release from local jails. There's been a lot of local activism around this. Um, Isla is a, um, a small group of immigration attorneys who do detention work who really mobilized a lot of groups and agencies and um, advocates to pressure the the mayor and the governor and local politicians and the ICE field office to um, release as many people as possible from detention facilities um, because, you know, in order to reduce the risks of the spread of COVID inside facilities and also to um, uh, try to get agreements that individuals would not be arrested and would not be transferred to faci facilities during the pandemic. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and unfortunately, the rates of COVID infections in facilities in Louisiana is very high. And there's also a lot of concerns that um, there's there's been actually a couple of staff at one facility in northern Louisiana who've died from COVID. Um, and in the midst of all of this, ICE has continued to transfer people from facility to facility within the state. and um, a lot of reports that they're being very messy about mixing in people who were quarantined due to having the virus or being exposed to the virus in with you know dorms and units who have not been exposed. So more and more information is coming out about what's actually happening and also that the numbers of confirmed cases that ICE is reporting is much lower than the actual numbers because for example, if the staff are staff of a private prison company that holds ICE detainees, they don't count as ICE staff. So ICE is not reporting the numbers of um, staff who are infected who work at the facilities accurately. Thank you, Julie. And we had a webinar on this last week, um, but even since then, so much has changed. And, and thanks for that answer. We're just, a, we have just a few more minutes. So I just wanna have one last question. This is going to be to Monica. And Monica, um, could you please describe for us the situation of one family or one individual that illustrates both the challenges that immigrants are facing during this COVID-19 pandemic and the strength and resiliency that folks bring to these challenges? Yes, I have a family that I've been working with lately and I've had I, her kids since 14 years ago, but she was picked up with the raids first. So she was recovering from that and now um, she works in the poultry plant and has, I mean, COVID. She's been sick for the last two weeks and now the children are worried and they're trying to call and ask for groceries. I've had calls from the girls worried about their mom's health. And that's how we knew that she was sick. And now we've been trying to get her to the doctors. There's no insurance and there's nine people sick in the home now and none of them are being tested. But I feel like they're strong people. I couldn't imagine going through the raids, being a single mom, having three kids, trying to figure out how I'm supporting them. And then now I can't work because of COVID. And it's one thing after the other. Their children are strong. I mean, I can't 14 year old calling, asking for groceries or trying to get mom medical help. It's this responsibility is now on the children's shoulders. And um, I got a call from her today and one of the girls is actually running a fever today. So it's oh just God. one after, it's like one hit after another. Wow, well, thank God you're, you all, you're there and uh, you're doing that important work and I know that um, uh, you have a lot of support from the community. Well, I, I just wanted to thank everybody um, for tuning in today and especially thank our amazing panelists, you know, not just for the information and insight they shared, before they work, they do day in and day out to support and empower our immigrant re and refugee sisters and brothers. Thank you again for turning in. And again, we'll have a recording of, of this webinar and slides sent to you next week. Thanks you all, take care and be well. <laughs>